college studying jazz, I was in over my head. I really, really wanted to learn how to improvise over jazz tunes, play over changes accurately, jam with my friends, jam with my colleagues, and I, I just was on a mission to figure it out, but I felt like I was way below where a lot of the musicians around me were. Uh, but I was practicing a lot, I was really taking it seriously, and I was practicing everything people say to practice, and I remember I saw someone on a, a bus, I was taking the bus home, and someone got on the bus who I knew, who was older than me, he was a trumpet player, he was a great player, I looked up to him, and we chatted a little bit, and he was like, hey, how's it going, like, how's your music stuff going? And I expressed my frustration in uh, how difficult it was to be able to improvise over jazz tunes. I was like, I'm really working on this, uh, and I can't piece it together yet. Uh, it's not it's not feeling right. It's not feeling fluid. I'm, I'm really practicing hard. And he said to me, well, just keep playing your scales and arpeggios. Keep practicing your scales. Keep practicing your arpeggios and it'll come together. Uh, I gotta go. This is my stop. He gets off the bus and I'm like sitting there <laughs> kind of frustrated or, you know, upset with myself thinking, what am I doing wrong? Because I am practicing my scales. And I am practicing my arpeggios, scales, arpeggios, vocabulary, all the stuff, up and down, on the guitar, all over the place, but it's not coming together uh, yet in the tunes. It's not. I'm not really speaking the language as I want to yet. Now, of course, I know it's difficult, it's a journey, it takes a long time, etc. But that advice was not helpful. Uh, I had to because figure out from the ground up, because every time I ask people, hey, do this, do this, do this, it's this disconnected thing to practice. Um, and I had to figure out how, at least for me, how am I going to figure this out to connect together the keys that are changing, the scales that are changing, the arpeggios, the chord tones um, in the moment, on the place on the guitar, and not just feel so disjointed and like I'm faking it when I play. So over a long, long, long time of practicing, figuring it out for myself, teaching private students, um, and I teach a lot of this stuff on my YouTube channel too, I did indeed figure out um, drills and exercises and a system that... Uh, works it from the ground up so I can see, feel, hear the connections of chord tones, uh, scale degree, or scale degrees and keys changing. And that's what I'm going to show you in this lesson here today. We're going to do it with chord tones. And this is a two-part lesson that is very similar to my two-part lessons series that I just recently did on how to improvise with scales over a tune while the keys are changing in the tune, drills from the ground up for how to do it. That's what we're going to do with this chord tone soloing, which I am a huge advocate of because I think it's the foundation of being able to find our voice and nail the changes. I have a course called Nail the Changes where I go over all that stuff, which is why I call it that, because that was my goal is to nail the changes. But I'm going to give you um, a big chunk of my system here in this two part series for how to do it from the ground up and know your chord tones so well that you actually see and can find the voice leading between chords, uh, which will unlock the built-in melodies that are inside of chord changes. And from there, we can do whatever we want in terms of finding our voice, all of that. So that's what we're going to work on here. Uh, let's do it step-by-step -step exercise series in this two-part lesson for how to get fluent at chord tone soloing. If you want to check out the scale improvisation series that I did that is very much like this same a system that we're going to do with chord tones. Check it out. There's a link in the description to get those lessons. Doing both of them is going to be important. We want to do it with scales and we want to do it with chord tones. And then from there, we're on our journey of having those fundamentals so down that we can experiment and find our own voice and uh, learn from other players and see how everything we want to play tonally inside of uh, chord progressions uh, fits within the necessary vocabulary, chord tones and scales. And so we need to drill those that we know them so well, then we can start getting creative with it. So let's start from the beginning and do our drills in just a sec. I'm Jared Borkowski from soundguitarlessons.com where I have courses on how to improvise, how to comp, how to master theory on the fretboard, build any chord, a lot of great trainings on my website. And of course I do a video here every Tuesday on YouTube. 
So here's the outline of this lesson that we are going to cover. Exercise one, we just need to know the theory structure of every chord. So we're going to go through the theory structure and we're going to work on the same tune that I did in my scale series because it's we need to go deep on one tune at a time, spend a lot of time on it to really know it. So we're going to continue to do the tune Solar by Miles Davis because it has a ton of chords in it, a ton of key changes, a ton of voice leading opportunities. And I was just practicing the song deeply myself. So I always like to show you what I'm working on. So exercise one, we're going to know the theory structure of each chord. Uh, in this case in this tune solar but of course you can do these exercises the point of this lesson series is you you want to do it with any tune you want to actually know and master exercise two is that we want to find the arpeggio shapes the chord tones in one position on the guitar just map them out so they're in one place as close as possible to each other exercise three is that we want to play those arpeggios up and down in time flawlessly ten times in a row without a mistake each chord uh, before we move on to trying to connect them together in the tune. I'm going to demonstrate all of these, just giving you the overview of the outline. And then exercise four is the last one in this video where we're going to play those arpeggios in time through the progression. And I'll explain that more when I get to that exercise. That's the one that gets us into it feeling and, and starting to go towards the actual song and the progression. Uh, very helpful stuff, very drill-like, very exercise-y, but this is going to lead towards part two, uh, the next video in this series where we're going to actually play in time over the changes and make it all work and at the end I have a important bonus tip for you at the end of this video about uh, a little bit of a perspective shift that really helps uh, for getting this stuff down and sticking with it so stick around to hear that at the end of the video if you want to follow along with the exact chord tone shape diagrams the arpeggio shapes that I'm using to do this lesson to improvise to drill this stuff for myself you can download a free PDF that is my chord tone arpeggio vocabulary pack. There's a link for it in the top of the description, or you can go to soundguitarlessons.com slash chord tones. It has all the diagrams uh, laid out on the guitar that I use in this lesson and that I use on any other tune when I'm doing this practice method. Before we get into exercise one, exercise zero, I would say, is always know the melody, know the melody of the tune that you're working on, understand it to some degree. You can go really deep on working on melodies, and I will have videos on that coming in the future, so make sure you are subscribed if you want to keep in touch with all the drills I'm going to do on all kinds of ways of knowing tunes. But for now, I'm just going to play you the melody so we have acknowledged it, so we get it in our ears, so we know what tune we're working on. This is Solar. <laughs> that's the melody let's move on to exercise one so exercise one or step one is just to know by heart the theory structure of each chord the chord tone the makeup of the chord tone so I'm just gonna go through and tell them to you here but this is something to just know with every chord type uh, what the structure is of them a minor major seven chord in this case C minor major seven it's a minor triad with a major seven so the way to know it outside of the guitar all of these we just want to be able to spell them with numbers uh, and one three five seven would be a major seven chord because it's all from the major scale and anything different from the major scale we're going to add a flat or a sharp tooth so, so that's how we're using uh, the spelling system here for chord tones so this is a minor triad one flat three five and then it has a major seven so the spelling is one flat three five seven that is c minor major seven okay g minor seven what's the spelling of a minor seven chord okay i'm thinking that when i'm playing i'm going to think the root is on g but otherwise i'm thinking of this structure the number relationships the chord tones um and the the whether or not something is flat or sharp and just how it sounds as opposed to every note name and I get that question a lot do you want to name every note name I personally don't you certainly can but I just think of do I know where the root is and do I know where the relationship of all the numbers uh, exist so minor seven is one flat three five flat seven so one note different from this one one flat three five flat seven okay dominant seven C dominant seven the root is C we call that one one three five flat seven is the spelling of that chord so I'm just gonna go through faster you just want to know the spelling of every chord you're working on outside of the guitar if you can play it on the guitar but you can't spell it like this you want to fill in that gap a little bit so major seven is one three five seven as I said just one three five seven from the major scale uh, minor seven we already did but let's say it again one flat three five flat seven dominant seven we already did let's say it again one three five flat seven major seven we already said one three five seven just gonna say all of them here okay one flat three five flat seven one three five flat seven 
Okay, one, three, five, seven for the major seven. Ah, a new chord type here. The half diminished or minor seven flat five, which is the circle with the line through it there uh, in terms of how this is written out for with the app I'm using called iReal Pro. Uh, D half diminished, this is one, flat three, flat five, that's a diminished triad, and then flat seven. One, flat three, flat five, flat seven, that is the spelling of D half diminished. G seven, uh, one, three, five, flat seven. We're not gonna worry about the flat nine for now because we're just doing the essential chord tones when we do this exercise um, and this set of drills. A flat nine is an extension and we're not gonna worry about that for now for these exercises. Uh, that is it for step one or exercise one, just to really make sure you know that with whatever tune you're working on, let's move on to the next exercise. Exercise two is to map out the chord tone shapes. This is what you can get for free with my PDF uh, with the link in the description or at soundguitarlessons.com slash chord tones. It's just a bunch of diagrams of all the chord types. Now with this system that I have created for improvising with chord tones, I actually have minimized our options a little bit to make things easier. Uh, with a minor major seven chord, um, I just, for this core kind of foundational version of the way I drill chords and do this exercise, I just do a C minor triad because it limits the amount of chord tones that we have to feel like we master over all over the guitar and it sounds great and works great over this chord type. When we combine playing scale ideas with it, that's going to include the major seven, that's going to include other stuff, that's part of that other series that I did that you can check out with the link in the description. So. It's kind of unique that this first chord here, I just, in this drill series, we're just gonna treat it as minor seven. You're more than welcome to add that major seven to the shape. There's a major seven of C. And you can map that out for yourself, but for this demonstration, I'm gonna do C minor triad over that. And uh, that will work great. There are no other uh, compromises like that in this progression. Uh, that's just to limit the amount of shapes that we want to do. And total with the vocabulary pack I have, for example, there's 12 chord types. And with those 12 chord types, we can improvise over any progression because of a couple of the uh, minimizing options that I've created, such as the minor major seven being a minor triad when we're doing this. Okay, minor seven, G minor seven. Here's the root of G. I'm just gonna show you the diagrams on the screen and play for you where I have mapped out all of these as close as possible to the fifth position. Um, and then you wanna do that anywhere on the guitar as close as possible to one position, find the shapes that all are kind of laying over each other, overlapping with each other, because that's how we're gonna improvise and find all the voice leading. So here we go. Minor seven, G minor seven. I'm playing from the lowest note to the highest note and back down. You can uh, emphasize the root if you want to hear the root of the sound, but we want to play it up and down. Okay, C dominant seven, here we go, fifth position. Okay, F major seven, fifth position. Very satisfying to hear them in, in order, we're gonna do that much more um, in a little bit. F minor seven, fifth position. Now it goes out of the fifth position a little bit for this moment but it's still as close as I can to the fifth, fifth position. Some of these shift a little bit, okay? So here it is again. Okay, B flat seven. E flat major seven. E flat minor seven. Uh, a flat dominant seven. That one's uh, physically annoying. We're gonna talk about that more because we have to drill it and practice it. Here it is again. Okay, uh, and then D flat major seven. And then D half diminished. And then G dominant seven. All as close as possible right here, map them out. Uh, and work on memorizing what those all are. We're gonna drill them next, so you don't have to master playing them, but memorize where where they are, how to play them up and down uh, without having to look at the diagrams. That is what this step is about. Let's move on to the next exercise. Okay, exercise number three, this is the real drill stuff. Probably similar to how a lot of us just practice arpeggios up and down, but now we're gonna have a very specific goal uh, that we have to pass before we move on, which is that we want to play each arpeggio shape, each chord tone form that we just reviewed there, 
from memory. You can't look at a diagram for it. You have to play it by memory, all in that position. And you have to play it 10 times in a row, and you can choose any number you want. Uh, if something is much, much harder, I sometimes just make sure I can do it minimum three times in a row. But the more, the better. Something like this, just a single chord up and down, 10 times in a row is great. Uh, so each chord through that progression, you want to be able to play it 10 times in a row without making a mistake. So if you play it five times in a row, and then on the sixth time you flub, you start the count over. And I've shared this many times on my channel. I have a bunch of picks lying here on my desk, and I just have, I have 10 of them specifically. And when I get it right, I'm gonna scoot one over. And when I get it wrong, I scoot them all back over until I get 10 in a row. So for this first chord, we're gonna go up and down like that. And part of the rules is that we have to do it in time, any tempo. Um, and I'm gonna play eighth notes, but any tempo, so long as you're playing consistent, um, constant notes at a certain duration. So I'm going to play eighth notes at 160. Okay, that was one. I'm going to scoot it over. And this triad is pretty awkward to play. Here's the second time. Okay. Uh, that's two. Here's the next time. Okay, a little sloppy, but let's say I got that, you know, three times and I, I tend to be really strict with myself. So I did do it, but there was a little open string that rang. I probably would start over because I really want to get it. Or I'd slow the tempo down um, and you know find a tempo you want for that. But let's move on just to demonstrate um, a couple more of them. So here is G minor seven. Ah, that's one, scoot it over. G minor seven, second time. scoot it over. The scooting over is very important. You don't just want to count and play it all in a row. You need the context feeling of it being fresh. So you stop. The temp, the uh, metronome can keep going, but you stop and then you have to get your hands back on and do it again rather than just looping it. You don't want to do that. Here's my third time. Okay, so you would do it 10 times in a row. I've done that on all of these. And when I do that kind of work, I consider it done. I don't come back and do it again. That's the benefit of practicing this way. I say, I have passed that level. Pretend you are playing a video game or something. You don't go back and work on a level that you already passed in that video game. You're moving on because it's fun. You want to get to the next thing. Or, you know, you don't do homework assignments from uh, third grade when you're in fourth grade, right? You, you're at the new level. So when you pass these things, just trust your past self. Like, I've done it. I, you know, you can keep track of it or not if, in whatever way, but for every tune, I make sure I can do this. If I'm gonna redo it later, I make it more challenging more times in a row. Uh, so, you know, something I haven't done yet. Higher tempo, something like that. Uh, but let's do a couple more uh, as an example. You get the idea though. So here is C dominant seven. I'm going from the lowest note to the highest note and back, so. Okay, that's one. That's two. That's three. Now, how can I sit here and do three in a row without a mistake and be confident that I'm going to do that while filming a video? Camera's rolling. Hey, here we go. Here's three in a row. Uh, it's because I've already done it 10 times in a row. And I like to prepare for my teaching videos by practicing that stuff. Now, okay, I'm going to do, I'm always going to practice what I tell you to practice. I'm always going to. And as often as possible, I'm going to demonstrate it as much as I can in the video as well. But of course, I don't want to do 10 on all every chord here. And in fact, you get the idea enough that I don't need to demonstrate the next one, but every chord type you want to do that. It's a great first step. If you can't do that by memory, how are we going to possibly improvise with it and connect them together? So up and down 10 times, nice and slow and relaxed, any tempo you want, but in time consistent, take those guidelines very seriously, the parameters that we set for ourselves, drill, pass the test, it'll feel great, and then you can move on to the fun stuff that we're doing next. Let's move on to the next exercise. Okay, ready for exercise four? This one is a beast. This one is our stepping stone between just drilling arpeggio shapes to actually playing in time over the tune. We need to play in time on this one. We need to be with a tempo, with a metronome. You want to, any tempo though, and you're playing constant eighth notes. You're playing up and down each arpeggio shape, but you're playing through the whole progression that way in time. So we need to get through every chord 
and then say that counts as having done it once. And for this, since that's such a big exercise, just if you can do that without making a mistake three times in a row, that's amazing practicing. And it will take you many sessions, many days, maybe weeks, depending on where your level is, maybe months, and that's okay. And you have a mission and a goal. Um, and it's going to feel really good to pass it. So I'm at 160 BPM. It's pretty fast. I just don't want to take a long time with the demonstrations. But any tempo for yourself, we're going to play through every chord up and down. It's not in time with the song yet, but it's the first taste of harmony changing in time in the order. It's going to feel like the harmony of the tune is moving. And this is a, a really important step. Think ahead while you're on one arpeggio. You have to know it so well you can think ahead. What's the next one? So you're ready to move to it on time. Check it out. One, two, three, four. G minor. C7. F major. F minor. B7, B flat 7. E flat major. So that was one time through the whole thing. If I was happy with that, I will slide my pick over or tally mark or count, you know, some way you're counting to get three in a row, right? And then I will start it over and try to get a second one, try to get three in a row, okay? That actually, like I said, I prep for all my lesson videos by practicing the exercises I'm gonna teach. That one, even though I've done it before on many other tunes, I haven't officially done it on this tune. That's a pretty fast tempo. It took me a while to do that. It took me a, a couple practice sessions and I was like, I'm going to get it. I got to get it. I got to get it. Um, and it's really worth it because what we're going to do next in part two is the stuff that true improvisation, true original melody creation on the fly is made of uh, the core ingredients. But this is all the setup stuff that we need first. Otherwise, we're not going to have much success with it. So two quick side tips for exercise four. I already said them, but I want to emphasize them. One, think ahead while you're playing one. So you're ready in time to switch right away with the tempo going to the next one. And tip number two that I already mentioned, but I want to emphasize is that once you do that, you don't have to do it again. You have checked it off. So you move on and just emphasizing that because we do this to ourselves, something we practiced a bunch and we got to the point we want it to get to, it starts to become comfortable and comforting to do it. And it sounds good and we feel good about ourselves. So we go back and try to practice this exercise that we've already passed. So again, my analogy is you're not doing homework for the grade that you were in a year ago you're doing you're moving on so move on to the next thing and set up that challenge it should be difficult you can get all the diagrams you need to play over any jazz chord progression with my chord tone vocabulary pack it's all the arpeggio shapes of 12 different chord types in all the positions they exist on the guitar and you can use those 12 different chord types to improvise over any chord progression just like we're working on here you can get that for free with the link in the top of the description or you can go to soundguitarlessons.com slash chord tones and here's my bonus tip for you that I promised. What I hear from a lot of people who want to work on this kind of thing is that it's so hard because they don't know the fretboard that well yet. They don't know where those chord tones are. They don't know those shapes yet. Now, obviously I'm giving us this step ladder approach, you know, from the ground up, but I just want to say that it's a fun, it's a funny thing to say that exercise is too hard because I don't know where those chord tones are. The reason that I'm giving you these exercises is because it is the exact thing to do to get an understanding of where the chord tones are, where the layout is on the fretboard and all that stuff. So I think it comes across as you're supposed to know this, hey, do this first, do this second, because it's a lesson, it's a video, and I'm demonstrating it, and I've already done the work that uh, took me a long time give or take, you know, depending on the exercise, but I just let things take as long as they take. And I just enjoy practicing it. And I set up the goal, like I talk about a specific milestone, and then it's fun to work towards because I'm like, I really want to get this. And even after I'm tired, I can do a little bit more focused practice even because I have a specific milestone. So a couple, uh, you know, a couple pieces of advice, I guess, are built into this. But the point is when something is hard, if someone says, hey, do this thing, do this thing, do this thing, like I'm showing you here, and you feel like, ooh, but to do that, it seems like I need to know 
the ingredients of what you're using. And the point of this kind of step-by-step -step exercise series is this is how you get to know those ingredients. There's no other way. So if your view of the fretboard is totally blank, and you're like, I have no idea where anything is. Great, do this, let it take as long as it takes, do it from the ground up, and that is how you are going to see these. And later in the future, someone else is gonna say, but how do you know where all those are? I can't do that yet. And it's like, well, you have to, it's a chicken and the egg thing. It's like, you, you have to do it uh, at some point to be able to see it. And yet we think we need to see it first, you know, see the clarity of where things exist on the fretboard. We think we need to see that first before doing the drills, but the drills are what get us there. Hope that makes sense. Just a little bit of motivation that, that um, it takes what it takes. It takes the work it takes. And um, the best thing we can do if we are frustrated with that is find a way to reframe how we're thinking of it to uh, enjoy that challenge. And one of those things that really works for me is the milestone, the goal. It gamifies it a little bit. Got to get this exactly with these rules, these parameters, this many times in a row. Then I'm hooked. Then I'm like, I can't wait to show up and try that again. Even though I could practice for an hour and not get that one thing done, uh, the next day, the next day, the next day it gets better So and closer. So uh, that's my little bonus tip for you. I do a, a lesson video every single week on this channel. Coming up soon is my part two of this video. Uh, I might have a video in between part two, but part two is coming very soon to give us the drills that we need inside the tune in time, truly improvising. I'm looking forward to that. I hope to see you there. Thanks so much for watching. Take care and happy practicing.